Thank you. It's great to see so many people here, especially so many young faces. Um, I'm hoping that this is going to be a very inclusive lecture that you will all be able to understand. I thought I'd start with some iconic images of medicine cabinets, which uh, were painted by, or well, arranged by Damien Hurst. And he had a very unusual way of arranging his medicine cabinets because he said he would arrange it depending upon which part of the body it interacted with, which I thought was quite intriguing if you try to do that. It's actually quite hard because most things have a much more global interaction than you might think. So most people, when I ask them, what's inside your cabinet? They say, oh, out of date drugs, things with no labels, um, the usual thing. But there are some common things that we all have, and I think it would be interesting to see how those work and if we can try to understand some of the chemistry behind their discovery. I've always been fascinated by chemistry, and I found this very old medicine chest quite fascinating because back in the 1900s, uh, there was a lot of poison in medicine chests and a lot of very unusual things that you wouldn't see today. For example, um, potassium cyanide, lead nitrate, um, as well as often elements. So if you're studying chemistry at school, you'll know that we chemists like to talk about the periodic table of elements where we classify everything according to molecular mass and atomic number. And as a child growing up, I found this quite fascinating that the world could be explained in terms of this table and how things would interact with one side of the table interacting with, with the other. And a lot of the inspiration for early medicine came really from the elements in this table. So you may know some of these. For example, um, lithium was long used for bipolar disorder. And actually, a lot of drugs that came into play were on superstition. There was very little hard evidence to show how these drugs interacted. And even now, people still take these lithium tablets and claim an effect, but there's no biochemical pathway that is really well established. We think that they may interact with uh, some of the enzymes and chemicals which are in the front part of the brain here, but the evidence and the identity of a receptor for lithium is still missing. I find it quite interesting if you trace back some of the early elements that are used in medicine and ask the question, is it really just a superstition? And one of the ones I found very intriguing is copper. And maybe some of you have these uh, copper bracelets that are thought to protect you against arthritis. And how did that ever come into to being? Um, in 1939, a German physician noticed that workers in a copper mine didn't have as much arthritis or rheumatism as the general population around, and so concluded that actually copper was extremely beneficial. And quite often when these mining workers came away from the mine, they then were, uh, sadly succumbed to arthritis and rheumatism, which was apparently pretty prevalent in Finnish copper mines at the time. So although a lot of it's based on superstition, there's quite good evidence to suggest that these early molecules uh, did actually have an effect. Another element that was used actually at the start of the war, you may know, was sulfur. And this was used um, as an antibiotic and turned out to be a really key ingredient in a lot of antibiotics that are used now. And I like this story being, as it's very Oxford-centric, <laughs> um, the discovery of penicillin was by Alexander Fleming, as I'm sure you all know. And he was working in Imperial College in London. And he went away on holiday and left some plates and noticed that the bacteria died after he'd left them. And he thought, well, what's, what's happening here? There must be some sort of antibacterial thing going on on the agar plate. But he couldn't isolate the key ingredient that was killing the bacteria. And working just down the road from where I work now, were these scientists, Flory and Chain, 
and actually Heatley, who actually did all the work. And then, uh, and then um, actually Fleming came with a bowler hat, apparently, which I found quite intriguing. Why you would visit a lab with a bowler hat? Um, and came to look and actually didn't really believe that these people had isolated what was to become penicillin. And of course, if you know the history of World War II, this was a, a real lifesaver in World War II. And it turned out that what was being put onto wounds was a sort of dye which released sulfur. So there was early evidence that sulfur was really critical in uh, antibacterial action. So sulfur in antibiotics, that's the yellow atoms in those structures. So in about the 1940s, these came into play and were used in World War II. But how do you find out what chemicals are in these drugs? I'm sure you young scientists at the back will know. Um, we would use a mass spectrometer. And I've included a very old picture of myself here <laughs> um, to show that I actually started using this when I was 16. And became fascinated with the workings of the mass spectrometer. In those days, as you can see, I mean, if you're here and you go on a tour of uh, Canterbury, the university here, you'll see that modern day mass spectrometers are packaged and small and tidy. But in those days, they were like this, shown on the right. I liked this because, as you can see, four men are sort of fixing it, and I'm the one who gets to drive it. So this was a very powerful position to be in. So I was able to um, tune. I thought I was tuning the instrument and really adjusting all of the potentials. Was, you can see there's a lot of switches and dials, and then you'd look down the oscilloscope to see if you could see your molecule flying through the mass spectrometer. And to me, this was the most exciting job. I had no idea that I was going to be doing this when I was 16. I applied to, to go to do this and then found out very quickly what this actually meant. But I became quite fascinated with the whole process. And back in those days, mass spectrometry was really used for penicillin, for identifying the structure of natural products. Many early drugs were from natural products, from plants, um, from bacteria. And these penicillin structures were all either synthesized or isolated. And the way the mass spectrometer works is to take your molecule, to put it into the vapor phase, so it's now in the atmosphere, and then to fragment it into pieces. And from those pieces, you could then stitch it back together again, rather like a jigsaw puzzle, and say, oh, the original molecule must have been this, because I know from all the fragments that I've generated. And for me, this was back in the day when there were no computers to do this. You had to do it by hand. So it's probably more rewarding than it is now, because I would sit and look at all these patterns and after a while, you became quite expert at sort of identifying the groups that would fly away from a molecule and then stitching it back up and um, unraveling the structure. So I continued at Pfizer for quite some time. And one of the projects that I'm very proud of having a contribution to was schistosomiasis. It took me a very long time <laughs> to learn how to say that word, but it's actually a tick-borne um, disease that comes from infected water and affects a lot of um, much poorer countries. And the reason I like the story is because I became fascinated by the fact that pharmaceutical companies could be altruistic. I think people don't really believe that anymore, but back in the time when I was quite young and impressionable, I thought, well, they're never going to be able to sell this drug for very much. So it's actually a great project to be working on, because if we can solve this and clean up the water, then we will save a lot of lives in Africa. So I was very um, proud of that one. I then um, continued at Pfizer for a further, uh, I was there in total for seven years. Very fortunately, they uh, thought that I shouldn't be a technician for the rest of my life. So they encouraged me to get some qualifications to go to a university <coughs> to do a PhD. And I ended up in Cambridge, which was fantastic for me. And one of the things I started to work on was peptide hormones. 
and peptide hormones at the times were often drugs. So um, back in this particular example, which is actually taken from my thesis, so it looks quite dated, but um, because we had to type it and, you know, it's not like you have these days when you um, have compu computers to produce all these things. And we had to sort of count the spectrum, but it's very much the same sort of spectrum, it has a molecular weight of 1622. And then we look at the fragments and we get the sequence of the peptide. And this particular peptide was isolated from a fish. And you know that fish can swim in different backgrounds. They can change their color to camouflage themselves. We wanted to know what that particular hormone was that changed the color of the fish. And we found out that it was the melanocyte stimulating hormone, which I was very proud of. And this was probably the best part of my, my PhD. It took me a very long time to do, and probably now I could do it in about 10 minutes, but that's progress. And um, I then left science for a while and had a career break uh, with my three children. And when I came back to science, the web had taken off. So I thought, I wonder if anyone really cared about my hormone, because I thought it was pretty cool at the time. And I googled the hormone, and you can try this. All of the hits I got were um, <laughs> to Michael Jackson, who'd <laughs> allegedly used something like this hormone to affect his own sort of whitening process. We have to say allegedly, because I'm not sure if it's true. But that's... Um, the history of my PhD. Um, <laughs> then um, I moved to Oxford after my career break, and um, very similar to Cambridge. <laughs> um, during the time of my career break, there was a Nobel Prize for chemistry, and it was for mass spectrometry. And it was totally transformative for the technique, because up until that point, um, many people would have said it was quite boring, which is not true at all. But for a lot of people, it was quite restricted to quite small molecules. And there was never any evidence that it would go to very large and very interesting molecules, such as whole proteins or DNA, the real molecules of life. It was a bit stuck with the sort of synthetic molecule that you could make in the lab or the peptide you could sequence. But the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was given to John Fenn. Um, he was about in his 80s when he received the prize. And what he'd done was to take a technique that was considered a very small molecule. And he said that he had given elephants wings, which I think is a nice analogy. Because if you think of a small molecule like an aspirin, molecular weight 180, and you think of a big protein like myoglobin, 16,000 molecular weight, that's the sort of transformation he'd made from very small molecules to very large molecules. So he'd effectively given these molecular elephants, as he called them, wings to fly through the mass spectrometer, because you still have to get your molecule into the atmosphere to be able to analyze it. And when I came to Oxford, my goal was to see if we could use mass spectrometry to study protein folding. So proteins are only really active if they have this very nice origami type folding going on. So if you unfold into a string of amino acids, most proteins would not be active. They have to be in this very intricate uh, fold, which is encoded by the amino acid sequence. So you can see on the right hand side, folded protein, you've got helices and then beta sheets interacting. And these are sort of hydrogen bonded across structure. And those are the active ones. So on the left hand side, inactive, right hand side, active. But mass spectrometry at that time didn't maintain folded structure. It totally unfolded things. It heated them, it acid denatured them. My job was to try to get these proteins to stay folded. And then we could look at their interactions. And I'll just briefly show you this movie, which shows the proteins coming into the mass spectrometer, going through a quadrupole. Don't need to worry about this too much. And then they get buffeted around here. You can see they're waving up and down a bit. And this is what we imagine is going on. They're getting hit by lots of residual gas molecules in the mass spectrometer. 
until they finally come through and register on the detector. And this gives us a mass spectrum. And it also gives us something about the folded state of the protein, and I'll come back to that. But in the early days, we simply used a labeling technique known as hydrogen deuterium exchange. And it's effectively like spray painting. So if you have your hand totally unfolded and you spray painted it, you could spray paint the whole of your hand. If you had your hand closed up like a folded protein and spray painted it, your palm would hopefully stay clean. So this is a way of changing the mass because the paint is going to weigh more than without the paint. So if you do that, you can then measure the mass of folded and unfolded species in a mass spectrometer. So for me, this was an exciting day when we finally proved that proteins could stay folded in the mass spectrometer. And you may think, that's not very exciting, and why do we care? Because why would they not be folded? And this was something that a lot of people didn't really believe that they could be folded. And so I include this commentary at the time, which was about my work, which said biomolecular folding in vacuo. And you'll see that there's the exclamation marks and the, and the question mark, because really this person didn't believe it at all, and saying that, you know, actually water is really important. And you'll know that in cells, they're not dehydrated. So proteins that are working in biologic, in your cells, will be folded and they will be surrounded by liquid. They won't be flying around in the atmosphere. And that was the thing that people found so surprising, that even without the water and the other components of the cell, these proteins could stay folded. So if you can keep your protein folded in the mass spectrometer, you have a magnificent opportunity to now go and look at how it might interact with other molecules be they drugs or other proteins or other small molecules, and to learn something about the, their function. And for me, because of my start in drug discovery, I wanted to go back to see if we could now take some of the drugs I'd been working on and see how they interacted with the folded proteins in your cells. So a modern day, <laughs> more tidy one than mine probably, <laughs> but. Why is it important that we try to understand this? Because if you think about it, you're going to take, hopefully not at the moment, but at least one course of antibiotics in every two years. This is the current average. Some people more, some people less. You probably have in your lifetime a staggering 14,000 prescription tablets. These are all the legal tablets that you get. And then, um, there's also 28,000 painkillers. So this is a staggering amount. So it would be quite useful to know what you're actually taking and how it works. And by the time you're in your 70s, you'd probably be on about five tablets a day. So I'm told. I'm not on that yet, so <laughs> it's good. Um, so understanding how antibiotic resistance occurs, of course, is a massive problem for us now because although we're very proud in Oxford to say that we like to think we discovered uh, penicillin and cephalosporin, people now say, well, you should sort out the mess that you started because, of course, everything is now becoming resistant to those antibiotics and we've got to think about new ones. So how is it that bacterial cells become resistant to antibiotics? There's lots of mechanisms that the sort of crafty bacteria invent to get rid of the antibiotics. They either digest somehow the antibiotic or they flip it out. And if you look carefully here, you'll see molecules coming in on the left and they're hitting these ABC transporters and flipping them in different conformations. And we realized that we could use the mass spectrometer to monitor this process. So drug comes in, it flips rather like a Venus flytrap and exports the drug. And this is not what you want to happen because it's chucking it out of the target cells that it's trying to attack. So if you look in the center, you can see the non-scientific bit, which is a Venus flytrap where something is coming in and you see it closes. You may have seen this in, in plants, so it engulfs its prey. But this is rather similar to what happens to efflux pumps, which pump out your drugs. So 
drug binds, pump opens and flips it out of the cell that it's trying to cure. And we measured this. This is the scientific bit. And if, if you're not interested in the mass spectrometry, you can just watch the middle bit. Um, so there's a drift time here, which tells us how long the protein takes to get through the mass spectrometer. And there's a master charge, which gives us the mass of the protein. And then these are all the different binding events. So um, when molecules bind to the pump, it increases the mass of the pump and it also changes the conformation. So simultaneously, it's binding and changing its conformation. And we can start to see this. Now, I never thought that would be possible when I started. I was just looking at the very small molecules and understanding their structure. But now I can look at them in the context of a flipping um, protein like this, which is binding and changing the conformation. So if you get to around here, you can see that there's an equilibrium uh, two species are present at once. One is open and one is closed because we've got so much binding of drugs and lipids going on. So this is uh, one of our first examples of looking at how drugs influence the effluxing out of the cell. And you may have seen these in biology textbooks. So bacterial cells and human cells are very different in shape and in composition. And if you look on the left, this is the bacterial cell. And you can see it's all very sort of hairy and um, yeah, uninviting to, to break into because it's got this sort of armory around the outside, whereas our cells are perhaps easier. But how do things get in and out of cells? This is, of course, a major concern in pharmaceutical um, applications because if you think about it, if you're trying to target a bacterial cell, which is in a human, you don't want to wipe out the human cells as well. So you've got to have some sort of selective mechanisms going on. And actually, this was some work that was started by Tim when he was in the lab, which was to take some of these efflux pumps and to see how they bind to known pharmaceuticals and to see if this is the way they get in and out of cells. And so we took 200 known pharmaceuticals. Again, this is the sort of sciencey bit. Um, and then we, we, we measured which ones were binding, and then we plotted on um, a very complicated graph you don't need to worry about particularly, just that a lot of the drugs that come through these pumps seem to be of a particular type. So we can start to predict how molecules are going to get into cells. They may have particular chemical properties, often quite greasy molecules go through these pumps, whereas um, more charged molecules use other mechanisms. And those in the red box, they don't need any help at all. They can just go through by osmosis into your cells. We've also looked a little bit about how bacteria make their cell wall. I told you they have this amazing armory. How do they do that? Maybe if we interfere with that process, we could stop them making this tough armory and it would stop them taking over in illnesses. And very recently, we identified one of the proteins in this pink box here, which is um, a protein that flips the lipid, one of the components of the bacterial cell wall. So the components are all here on the left, and then they go along this production line to form the outer wall of the bacterial cell wall. If we interfere here, we can maybe knock out this uh, assembly process. And we identified this reported this year. And actually, interestingly, <laughs> vancomycin binds to form a ternary complex with this particular protein, which is called MERJ. And vancomycin was one of the molecules I worked on at Pfizer when I was a 16-year-old. So life goes round and round in circles, and you keep re-meeting things that you met many years ago. I'm going to give you a tiny break from my talking now, because I'm going to share with you this video, which is on the BBC, so it must be true, um, of a schoolgirl who actually wrote to me to ask me what I sort of do all day, which I found quite interesting. Dear Professor Robinson, I saw your picture in some fibroid square, and when I grow up, I want to be a professor of chemistry like you. I would love it if you could come into my class and talk to us. I have a chemistry set in my house that I could show you. Thank you for reading my letter. Yours, I wrote to her because, um, Dean Carol Robinson, because she was the 
first female professor of chemistry that um, the University of Oxford has had in about 300 years. She showed us um, olive oil and water, how it would be mixed and they separate. Um, and then she put a vitamin C tablet in it and it created acid and pockets of air and it kind of separated the oil. Today's kind of changed me a bit. I've realised like kind of how chemistry is useful to the world and how it can help people. Um, because I knew it was making medicines and things like that, but I didn't know you could make drugs that could save people and travel the world to do like give it to people who are poor. So that is what I do, <laughs> travel the world giving drugs to people who are poor. I quite like, <laughs> I quite like that idea. Um, there is a tiny bit of truth in that because uh, we are interested in um, something that I'm sure you will have heard about, which is HIV. And you will know famous people in the 80s, um, sadly, who died, Freddie Mercury and Rock Hudson. But it's still a prevalent disease now and still lots of people die from HIV. This is in 2013 and you can see again pharmaceutical companies have a sort of interesting ethical issue because a lot of the people to treat can't really afford the medicines to be treated. So if you see um, the areas which are most darkly coloured, these are the highest prevalence of HIV. So what is HIV? It's a very devastating disease um, and it attacks the body's immune system. So that means that any infection you get, it's very hard for you to cope with it and eventually, unfortunately, you, you tend to die. Um, but there are a number of ways in which pharmaceutical companies have discovered to intervene with this process. So the life cycle of HIV is through budding and through there's, um, you get this immature virus that forms a mature virus and then fuses with the body's cells. And I can probably show you this in a... So there it is budding, but you don't see the infection coming in. So here we come with the infection into the cell. It's a bit slow. Um, it's not usually this slow. Um, it lands on the surface and then you'll see the DNA coming in being replicated, you'll see it then pops off and then restarts with another cycle. And actually, um, HIV grows incredibly quickly via this mechanism. It reproduces and, and transmits itself to many, many millions of particles in, in blood. And we were interested in how effective is this particular drug, which is actually given to poorer countries but is not used in more wealthy countries where there are now probably better medicines. And the reason that Coletta is effective in treating HIV, but it also has some very nasty side effects. And one of them is known as progeria. So this is actually a four-year-old girl who uh, was treated with this anti-HIV treatment and it attacks the lamin in the nucleus here. You can see this is a normal cell. This is one that's not behaving properly and she gets this sort of premature aging. So she looks much older than a four-year-old. And we wanted to see if it was true that these drugs actually attack this uh, metalloprotease. And you can see this is <laughs> yet another mass spectrum of the metalloprotease. It, it binds to zinc and it, you can see it very clearly. But more importantly, we could show that in the normal circumstances, this protease can process lemon and keep you healthy. But in the presence of the drugs that are in cholera, this process is impaired. And we, of course, this is not a popular paper to present or to publish because it really shows drug companies in not such a good light because they're using something which they know has side effects and um, are using it because it's actually cheaper than something without the side effects. So there's always these ethical issues in, in drug treatment. But also connected with HIV, 
it's very interesting that 1%, so that would be about three or four of us in this room, have a natural immunity to HIV. So why is that? And the reason for that is that we have mutations in one of these proteins that actually allows the infection to come into our cells. So the CD4 is one receptor, but CCR5, which is a GPCR, which I'll come on to in a moment, is another receptor, which sort of opens the door. So these two both have to be attached. Now, if you have mutations in CCR5 here, then you don't open the door to the infection. So you have this natural immunity. And natural immunity is great for drug discovery because it gives you a clue as to what to go for. Because if you're naturally immune to the disease, then if you could also mimic that immunity, you would have a cure that would probably not be too invasive. So by targeting CCR5, which is a GPCR, you could potentially, and this is the target, of course, of Miravac, which is quite a common anti-HIV drug. This is how this actually works. It blocks the second door that's required for entry. But this, to me, made me think about GPCRs. Now, GPCRs I haven't introduced, so these are known as G-protein-coupled receptors. They're the biggest target for drug discovery because they are sitting on all our cells. They receive signals from all different stimuli, from pain to um, any sensation you can think about, control lots of important bodily functions. So if you could target GPCRs, you'd be in a really uh, good position to find some new and exciting drugs. So can we shed new light on GPCRs? And why do we think we can? These are very difficult proteins to study. They are not present in very large amounts to start with and they're very floppy, so they're quite hard to stabilize in a folded way in the gas phase of a mass spectrometer. One of the reasons why I think we can add new knowledge is because there's often two things that bind. So there's an agonist and then there's another molecule, so there's often two molecules that bind, and we would be able to see this using the mass spectrometer. This is um, why we think we have a, a good chance of doing this. And this is the first one that we looked at, which is the P2Y1 receptor, which is involved in antithrombotic treatment. So thrombosis, you'll have heard about. So this is a drug for thrombosis. And we could see this binding directly to its target. But it's not just about binding. It's about how these receptors communicate with their downstream partners. So you have a signal, you pass it on down through this chain of proteins, and you can go down different signaling pathways. So you could go down signaling A, B, or C, and you would get different sensations. And we, uh, a lot of people believe that um, you could change the small ligand that binds and go down a different pathway. And this is really a very powerful way of looking at how you could attenuate responses in the body. Can we recreate this in the mass spectrometer? This is very recent work. Um, again, this is a bit of the sciencey bit. Um, so an agonist binding to a GPCR triggers the binding of a downstream partner. And we want to be able to say which of these downstream signaling partners is recognized by the different agonists that is bound. And this is actually one of the, we think, one of the very few ways that you're <coughs> going to be able to do this and really uh, work out how drugs are affecting these partners. Why, is, why else is it it's important? And one of the targets I'm very interested in is there's a lot of metabolism that is controlled by GPCRs. And you will know that one of the most threatening things currently is maturity onset diabetes or type 2 diabetes or um, obesity more widely. So if we could control some of these receptors, we may have a better way of treating some of these cell metabolism issues. And this is one of the first ones that we did. And this is the adiponectin receptor, which is actually is involved in type 2 diabetes. It's a project that we've been doing with Genentech. 
and we can see how small molecules um, change the interactions here. And this story I think you'll find quite interesting because GPCRs also interact with another class of molecules known as ion channels. This is a bit gory. Um, but imagine if you could never feel pain in your life. How would that be? What would it be like if um, <coughs> any kind of physical torture you couldn't respond um, because you didn't feel it? There are families around the world who have mutations that mean that they feel no pain. And again, it's these mutations that lead you to understand more about the disease. So there was a family in Pakistan where a young, a young boy, you may know this story, a young boy um, actually used to mutilate himself quite regularly uh, in a marketplace because it drew attention and raised money. And he actually felt no pain. But unfortunately, he was driven to do more and more daring <laughs> stunts and unfortunately was killed because we need this pain response to protect ourselves. So if you had no pain, it would actually not be a good thing. You need some pain in your life to make you pull back from things that are actually quite harmful. But again, these ion channels give us a link as to um, how we might control pain. So you don't want to take away pain, but you might like to um, mod modulate it or moderate it a bit. And uh, we've just started to look at these, and we've started to look at how drug binding to ion channels is manifest in the mass spectrum. I'm not going to show you any more mass spectra, uh, or in detail anyway, maybe a few, but not in detail, just to show that it's now possible to study drugs in these channels which mediate pain. And actually, <laughs> interestingly, on Radio New Zealand, Kim Hill said to me, on whatever day it was, she said, well, what makes you think that you can discover a new drug and take on pharma who have much more money and much more resource than you're ever going to have? Well, actually, you're yeah, right. You know, how can I say that I will? And then I think the answer for me is always, if you have a different view, maybe you can see something that no one's seen before. So we actually do think we have a different view because if you were working in big pharma, you would never do these type of experiments that I'm about to show you now, whereby you take something that's actually in the cell wall, still functional, and you just put it straight into the mass spectrometer. Now, normally you wouldn't do that. You would isolate bits of the membrane, you would prepare them and um, sort of purify them, extract them. But here we've just taken bits of a native membrane. And so we're going to learn something we think that no one's seen before. And certainly we have, certainly we can't understand all, the, all that we've seen at the moment, but we've seen some new complexes that have not been reported previously. For example, this ATP synthase next to its chaperone, which causes its insertion into the membrane. So this is, I think, quite exciting because we're going to be able to challenge our native membranes with drugs and see how the actual native when I say native, I mean not touched by human hand, basically, as it is wild-type uh, natural membrane um, without any modification. So this is, I think, very exciting for us, and we're still trying to understand all of the results. We, we do have some new interactions going on in the membrane that have not been reported previously. And the other thing that I think works quite well for drug discovery, which I'm hoping to play on, is that it's often not by design, but by accident. And one of my favorite stories, of course, is that of when I was at Pfizer, my first boss was Simon Campbell, and he was famously knighted, and the headline was Arise, Sir Viagra, the Queen's Knight Inventor of the Sex Performance Drug in the UK 2015 Honours List. Now, some of you may not know what this was. This was a drug that was designed to increase blood flow in the heart initially, but actually was also transmitted to other organs and was reported as such. So, and also this year, 
There was another report that <laughs> Viagra, which is a magic drug, um, could also stave the onset of dementia because it also increases blood flow in the brain. So there's a lot of repurposing of existing drugs. There's a lot of accidents that happen that actually turn out to be good trial and error accidents. And there's a lot of opportunity for seeing things that have not been seen before. So with that, I believe that we have an ability to study a folded protein in an environment that hasn't been used before for drug discovery. We will see new things, and we will be able to target some of the most debilitating diseases. I want to move beyond my experiments with vitamin C tablets <laughs> into something a bit more meaningful. And hopefully, these diseases will not just be in the affluent Western world, but also for much poorer countries, as suggested by Connie. So with that, I leave you with actually one of my favorite quotes, which is, if you want to see different results, don't do the same thing, which I think is so true. If everybody does the same drug discovery, we're all going to get the same drugs or not, as the case may be. But if you do something different, then at least you stand a chance. And I would like to thank all of the people who've been in my group, um, past and present, all of our um, support from financial, uh, from grants, also the University of Auckland uh, School of Biological Sciences who supported and funded me to come over to New Zealand many times. It's been a great pleasure to visit New Zealand and today is no exception. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you have.